This is uh, Dylan from Oregon. <clears throat> hey, I just wanted to uh, talk to you a little about um, the Oregon gubernatorial race we're having here. Yeah, closer than it I should be is my understanding, right? Yeah, much closer. Um, basically, we have a third-party candidate running, and um, uh, <laughs> it looks like it's going to be very close. And I think the reason it's going to be very close is kind of something that you hit on uh, a lot in this show, which is um, uh, that there's a lot of, there seems to be a lot of uh, moderate Democrats here in Oregon who are f freaked out about homelessness and they, they uh, just get angry and they, um, you know, that, that's kind of the Republican and the independent running are both drilling into this this narrative that like we're going to do something about this um but it, it's what are they going to do what are they going to do i mean the thing to be done is to house people the only other thing you exactly. can do is essentially arrest them um or just make sure that they're not visible yeah that's the thing i feel like a lot of these folks i live kind of in the suburbs and it just feels feel like a lot of these people when they talk about it um they're like they just want it to disappear like totally disappear and so you know these gubernatorial uh, the governors that are running or the candidates that are running are talking about it as if they're going to fix the problem with very few details but i mean i mean the republican plan essentially is like push them all into a volcano you yeah. know make yeah. like make them totally disappear and so i guess it's really frustrating talking to other people i know out here um i guess what what do you think because the problem with it really is that you know, it's kind of a function of our economy. Like, we need this level for our economy to function the way it does. We really have, like, this system where we need this amount of people living in the street. Well, and I, it almost feels like a governor can't combat that on their own. I mean, some yes. cities like L.A., I know, is trying some, some policies that may come into effect. But I guess, what do you think? You know, how well, do you do messaging and, and also policy? The that? problem is, is that we have rents are going through the roof in these areas. That's what I mean. I mean, the biggest problem that we have in terms of homelessness is the expense of living in a home. And I mean, without a doubt, you have, um, you know, in some instances, uh, uh, mental issues. In some instances, you have drug issues. I mean, I frankly, I would be shocked if um, uh, somebody lost their home because they can't afford the rent become homeless and don't turn to drugs i would be shocked or have like severe or, mental health crisis or and then start it. having mental health crisis i mean i, I mean it, it, it's I, I don't know how humans frankly could react in in our society to having no no home to live but the inciting event for homelessness is the far more often than not the loss of an ability to pay for a home some instances it's domestic, uh, domestic abuse um, and, and others, but at the end of the day, you need to either build more housing or you need to have some form of rent control or uh, rent subsidization. But really, we need to build more housing. And, right. um, you know, there's, there's, a, there, there, there's a multi, or, or uh, you know, we have ten. We have sixty thousand rent control apartments that are empty in this city. Sixty thousand rent control apartments that are empty because the landlords realize, like, if they, they they are trying to get outside of the rent control laws, they are trying to figure out how they can get uh, higher, um, uh, you know, rent. And, and nobody. And let's put it this way: nobody buys an apartment and then has rent control imposed upon them. That, that hasn't happened. This is, everybody who bought these rent control apartments or owned these rent control apartments, they knew it was rent controlled from the beginning. And they just, A, they're still making money even under rent control, or B, they thought, well, maybe if somebody dies and I can get, you know, and uh, they don't have any relatives and I can get them out of the apartment, then I can put it on and market and, and market rate and this and that and rents out of control. There needs to be action that is, uh, you know, I don't know that a governor in, in and of themselves can do this without like having the state house pass legislation to this effect. Um, 
but we need federal and state legislation to build new housing i mean i'm not uh, i i i i am at least in the short term agnostic as to like how do you go about um putting uh homeless people into this housing i'm sure there are a lot of people out there who are experts who have different uh, ideas about how to do that whether it's like uh, you build the housing and then you provide rent subsidies or you just have a government run or whatever it is like i i'm agnostic as to that there's no doubt in my mind there are people who have figured out this who are smarter who study this stuff but there is also no yeah. doubt in my mind it is going to require society on a state and federal level to expend money to build more housing period yeah and, and if I could just say one more thing, I think one thing this kind of segues into the money and politics problem, which I think the the independent person running her name is Betsy Johnson, and she's basically like you know former Democrat turned non-aligned because the Democrats went too far to the left. That's kind so of so woke, way, right? yeah. And she she got backed by Phil Knight, the founder of Nike. Basically, in Oregon, we have Nike and Intel. Those are like the two biggest companies oh, or large companies in the Portland metro area. And so the founder of Nike, Phil Knight, backed her campaign. And then right when, like, then she was reaching like 10, 15 percent polling. And then, like, then he turned and backed the Republican. And so it's, it's like <laughs> she's not going to win, right? But she's right. going to pull more. Spoiler. Right. Voters. Yeah. It, there's a spoiler who, you know, think are like, you know, these people that live in, like around me who think like, oh, this is not a Democrat or a Republican. This is like just a person who has good ideas, you know. And at the end of the day, that's why this is that close. And like, I just, you know, th this is kind of a, a real problem we have in Oregon, because usually we haven't had a Republican governor since like, I was born in the 80s, you know. Mm. And it's interesting. I watch uh, yeah. Dylan. I, it's Bradley. I watched the um, I watched the first gubernatorial debate that they had. Uh, Drazen, Kotek, and Johnson. And Betsy Johnson's lane there is interesting because she basically always gets it back to saying we need someone who's not affiliated with either party to get everyone together. But then basically everything she actually says in terms of her policies is either kind of some pseudo libertarian like yeah. uh, resource yep. hoarding thing or um yeah. a kind of standard garden variety uh uh yeah uh, conservative talking yeah. point like she either is agreeing with christine drazen or is saying something that's basically unfeasible yeah. and, and a libertarian talking point you're absolutely true with the one one exception of she says she's pro-choice but it doesn't hey, that's the only thing yeah. right in oregon oregon's a very pro-choice state like um but even like Kristen Drazen, like you look at the brochure, the pamphlet, the voter pamphlet, doesn't say anything about her views on, she's anti-choice. You know, she's anti-choice. Um, so, you know, she, she, she does that because she seems to appeal more moderate, right? Um, and she does, so, a very, yeah, she does a very great rhetorical device of speaking very softly mm. and quietly and gently to be like, women should not. I learned horses. that from watching Brett Weinstein. <laughs> That's Weinstein's. right, she does the Heather Hyde thing. <laughs> the White Horse, yeah. the Dark Horse, Dark Horse <laughs> podcast. Speak softly and well, carry water listen, for fascism. Hang in there, uh, you know, yeah, keep get, get your friends voting. I appreciate the call. Yeah, absolutely. Hey, thank you so much, guys. I've been listening to you guys for about a decade. You guys do great. And, and Thanks. guys and gals, well, thank Thanks. you. Oh, thank you. It. Hitchens Ghost. Hi, I'm our crew. I work in Sa Sacramento with three conservatives who consider themselves to be moderate. In response to the issues of homelessness, two of the three sincerely believe we should flood the streets with fentanyl. We've discussed it many times, and I've appealed to their humanity, hoping, hoping they'd back off. But they absolutely hate these poor people on the streets. Jeez, so like, if that, suggesting to flood the streets with fentanyl so people die? Population yeah. control, yeah. Oh, great. They claim on house people would refuse any help offered by the government, so eradication is seriously on the table. It's hard to carry on normal, uh, like normal, while knowing these people are monsters in the inside. That is wild. That's, I mean, that's how they feel. They want, they, they don't want homeless people to be in their eyes, in their eye line, and it bothers them to the, see people who are suffering. And so, instead of just like having a human, a human response to that, they, they literally, they want them dead. They want them dead. They wouldn't say it out loud. Maybe they'll say it behind the scenes. It's, just, it's the same things that we, we talk about with trans kids. They don't want them to exist. They don't want to see them. They want them to either be in the closet, conform, 
be in the closet or we or kill yourself that's how they feel and they wouldn't say it publicly but it's the case it's like that texas woman that said i i'm i'm mad that my kids can't bully gay and trans kids anymore that's how they feel um exterminationism man yep and that and, and it, even for those who don't want them exterminated it is Warehouse. eliminationist yeah. yeah right i mean it's like they can exist, but I don't want to see them. Put them in an institution, just like... Do you have, like, an underground warehouse? Well, that's the thing. It's a warehouse, because it's not yeah. even an institution. Yeah. Because that, that would involve publicly financing, care and stuff uh, like that. you know, care for people. Um, I mean, that's... And, and to be clear, too, like, the idea that the police are the solution for this is um, you're just basically saying we need someone to take them to the warehouse. And yeah, when when people say like, yeah, the, the you'll see journalists say like, where are the cops when this is happening? Well, they're probably sitting on their ass, um, you know, having a slow response time to send people a message for, um, you know, criticizing them two years ago. Well, it also is like, this is not a strategy. For, well, it is a strategy. We could just arrest everybody. But why stop at people who are unhoused? Let's also just arrest people who are living in poverty. Well, we sort of do that. Yeah, kind of. What about people who are living... We have uh, over a half a million people in the city who live in public housing. We could save on that if we just put them into jail. Well, they're potentially homeless, too. It's a preemptive arrest. Um, I mean, we could just expand this theory to a lot of things. And for those of us, hopefully... You know, we're one of them uh, who are living on the outside of these prison warehouses. <clears throat> you know, think of like what it would do. We got a problem with traffic. Let's arrest, uh, you know, a certain percentage of drivers. I mean, but this in a context of us being the number one uh, in terms of raw numbers, jailer of human yeah. beings. And uh, in terms of like just uh, the racial sort of equity portion of that, arresting black people at a higher rate than apartheid South Africa did. That, I mean, that is, that's the, the point. Like, that's why these, like, we're doing that already for a certain right. percentage of our population. And we're just... When we say, like, oh, the way you deal with the homelessness, just arrest them all. But this is... But this just is, arrest them all. That is an extension of what we look to the police to do. We can either... And, and on some level, it's also an extension of what we look to schools to do. We have these problems that we decide we're going to live with or we're not going to do anything about as a society in terms of addressing the causes of this problem. The reason why the vast majority the vast majority of people are are unhoused the reason why uh, the vast majority of those unhoused people are unhoused is because they cannot afford a place to live now there may have been in some instances maybe in some uh, many like other things that contributed to their inability to make money to house themselves and it may have become a cascading spiral but the the number one but for in terms of unhoused people is that they don't have a house we just talked about it in the context of uh houston. The, of, of houston what i've just mentioned but like finland right finland uh, when bernie sanders interviewed that uh finnish politician they only have around four thousand people who are homeless in the entire country and that the the countries around the population of uh, new york city how many homeless people are here in new york city i mean the, they, they provide housing for people. Other countries provide these kinds of services and health care services. So if you have mental health issues, you can you can get that taken care of. And and so it, it, honestly, it's just people like naturalizing capitalism and then blaming human beings for bearing the brunt of it and want and, and just offsetting their anger about a system onto the people who are the most vulnerable in our society. And we see this we see this in so many places, especially in New York City, especially under Eric Adams, that, you know, poverty is just criminalized and poverty then as a result becomes expensive 
Mm -hmm. being poor becomes expensive. If you're a vendor selling fruit in the subway and Eric Adams doesn't want you to do that anymore, you no longer have a job and you probably have a fine to pay or you're in jail and you have bail to pay to get out. And then after you you get out, you can't do your job because Eric Adams says you can't do it anymore. You hop a turnstile. You you two dollars and fifty cents puts you in jail and you probably have to pay bail that you can't pay because you tried to get it get out of a two dollar and fifty cent metro card swipe i mean it's it is it is impossibly it is prohibitively expensive to be subject to the criminal justice system when you don't have any money and people don't allow you to people don't allow you to participate in the workforce or have a home and we judge societies based on how they treat their most vulnerable you look at homeless people in this country you look at the incarcerated people in this country disabled people in this country trans people of color and they're all in one way or another treated like less than human by a lot of different people and a lot of people mostly in power yeah yep well said